Welcome to Adventures in Surgical Weight Loss with Dr. R. I'm Dr. Richard Rasmussen. I'm a bariatric surgeon and excited to bring you another story from a surgical weight loss patient. My goal is to give patients a place where they can share their amazing stories. I get to hear these stories all the time. I hope through this process to get rid of some of the bad information that exists about surgical weight loss. Today we get to learn from Carrie Sipple. Carrie is about nine months out from a gastric bypass. She's done really well and shares some great insights. Today I get to sit down with Carrie Sipple. Welcome, Carrie. Hello, Dr. Rasmussen. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great, thanks. Well, why don't you tell us your story? Well, um, I'm about to be 50. And I needed to make some big changes in my life. Um, I've struggled with weight all my life. My genetic background, my dad was bigger. I'm built like my dad and uh, and look a bit like him. And then my mom has always struggled a little bit with her weight too. Um, so being younger, I was one of those chunky uh, elementary school kids leaned out a little bit in junior high and then um got into swimming in high school and college and I I did that. So, you know, I there was a period of time I was working out twice a day, um division 1 athlete and um 12% body fat because they measured us in, in college back in the 90s. And, um, so there was that period of time, but when I got out of swimming and it was funny, my coach told me this, your shoulders are going to end up at your, your waist, meaning your broad shoulders are going to, you're going to get, they're going to drop and you're going to gain the weight around your hips. And I was like, yeah, or whatever, uh, started having a family and that absolutely happened. And it just snowballed. You get busy with life. You get busy raising a family life. Things happen, you know, um, divorce or uh, losing family members, you know, all of us have different traumas we go through that maybe add to uh, certain situations uh, where we struggle with, with eating or um, start the unhealthy relationships with food. And um, so I tried to write it in my mid thirties. Um, that was right about the 2008, uh, housing, the recession, the housing uh, crash and all that. And I joined um, a law enforcement agency. I was able to lose weight. I got to 180, 100, 170 pounds, um, went through the academy, was able to run the mile and a half and sprint and do push-ups and sit-ups. And, you know, I wasn't like the strongest or the fastest, but I, I, ma I made it through. Well, over 16 years now that I've been with my organization, I've the weight has gone back on and on and on. And to the point where it was a se several years ago, I wanted to do something about it, but like, I can't qualify for anything and qualify for insurance. At least I didn't think. And so I continued to let it go and just try to tell myself I'm okay with who I am. And I really in in here was not okay with who I who I am, and um, so I had been told I needed to go do a training. And trainings were hard for me, right? We're doing defensive tactics, we're doing physical stuff some sometimes, and here I am. At times, I was two hundred and eighty when I met met you in in your office. I was uh, weighed in at two sixty seven, um, and it was always embarrassing. Like who wants to work with the big heavy girl, um, big heavy girl sweats, big heavy girl, you know, and I was always afraid of, uh, especially over the last few years, injuring myself, doing some sort of new takedown. And like, I'm no martial artist, you know, <laughs> and my mobility isn't, wasn't the greatest. So, um, it was, it was embarrassing. And then I was asked to go up to get my pistol certification. And it's, I spent a week uh, re-aggravating an old knee injury. 
and having to go on light duty after that and having people help me get up and down off of the ground when we were doing different drills from the ground. I said enough. And I started changing my eating. And that only got me so far. And I started getting frustrated because what I was doing wasn't sustainable. Um, eating salads every day, just not sustainable for the rest of my life or even a year. So I um, was on Facebook one day and your group popped up and I was like, click. And I made the call. So that that was kind of where I started and uh, ever so grateful that I did uh, take that <laughs> leap. Wow, that's great. Um, what, uh, um, once you decided, okay, I've got to make it, make a change, um, to take us a little bit through that process and, and what were maybe some of the highs and lows of that? Okay. So, um, you know, I had to have the right mindset going into this and I knew that, um, I knew that this was a tool that was going to help me achieve the goal. I was struggling with comorbidities. Um, I had gastric reflux that I was seeing breakthrough uh, issues at night um, where sometimes I was waking up and I had throw up in my mouth like bad. Um, I have asthma, which uh, that's not something that's going to go away. It's better. Um, I'm on less medications for it, but uh, it's eosinophilic asthma. So that's a little different than just like an athletic asthma, as you know. Um, and the and the reflux can make the asthma worse because you can get up and some of that can get into your lungs, especially at night. And yeah, and and so I was sleeping like up on three pillows, always uncomfortable. Um, I had as as many women my age do urinary incontinence, and and that's kind of an embarrassing thing for all of us to talk about because. Uh, you know, I could just be standing there. It wasn't even a, a stress incontinence. It would just go. And I know I'm not alone in that, uh, but I felt alone. I felt really alone. Um, and a lot of it was attributed to my weight and poor eating and high sugar uh, diet. Along with that was, was on my way to diabetes, you know, female fat over 40, and, you know, my A1C, I think, got as high as uh, 5.9. 5 so um, I was up on my way. It was just a matter of time before something was going to break. Uh, I also have sleep apnea. And I fought the CPAP for the longest time until uh, the driver's license division always makes you renew that every few years with your doctor. And you, you got to be using it to keep your <laughs> license. So... Uh, I finally resigned myself to that, but um, that those those things there were kind of like continue to throw me over into that that journey. I wanted to change those things. Here I was last year, just turned forty nine when I first reached out to you guys, and went. I I keep adding these things, and then a kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease popped up on on the radar for my primary care physician, and I was just like. I still um, have several years before I can retire. Um, my job isn't easy to do being the size I was and not having the mobility and the, the physical fitness uh, to run to responses or do different, different things um, that I need to do from time to time. So uh, I just, I made the call, came and saw you guys, and it was, uh, you know, you're going to have to stop smoking. I was a smoker. My husband was a smoker. Uh, I say was because that was that thing that was like, all right, I'm doing this. I'm quitting. And I quit um, a few days before I, I saw you guys. Uh, my husband quit two weeks later and we're both still nicotine free. Um, I love it. Yeah, I know. I do too. Because it with my asthma, it wasn't good and <laughs> it just complicated everything. And I hate admitting it. it this is all embarrassing. But again, I'm hoping I can help other people by telling my story and people can go, oh, yeah, I feel that way, too. Or I've been there and I understand and I'm not alone. Um, and, and, then, and I'm glad you bring that up, because that is one of the reasons for the, one of the whole reasons for this podcast is 
is, you know, I get to hear these awesome stories and, and, and you're right. There's lots of common threads and, and, and people don't hear them from, from each other or, or from others. And so, um, Thank you for being uh, brave and willing to share those things because, yes, it will relate to a lot of people. I hope so, because, you know, there's I, I was really hesitant and even telling um, and I had been for months telling my own uh, staff because I'm a supervisor. Um, what I've been going through, they've obviously noticed, like, you've lost a lot of weight. You went down. I'm down 118 pounds. And wow. my nine months will be October 11th. So I'm, I've worked really hard. This didn't come easy. This wasn't just, uh, you know, the change of the stomach. It's a tool, like I said, and I've been, I exercise. I really am careful with what I eat. I'm not perfect. And I know I've watched other, your other podcasts and I want people to understand it's not perfect. Um, but perfect practice makes perfect. So I try yeah. and we all no, do. No, that's great. And, 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 uh, you know, none of us can do it perfectly, but it's, it's the consistency and, and, uh, getting after it day after day. And, and, uh, you know, when we, when we slip up, just, you know, making those changes and, and I was going to comment too, I mean, 118 pounds in nine months, you have been working very hard because that puts you kind of ahead of what the natural curve would be. Right. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, nice work. Yeah. And, and that's something people need to understand too, because as, as I've talked uh, to some people, not everyone has the same reaction. I mean, my reaction, my body's reaction to it or how I dealt with my new tool could have been different. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's not the, it's like the rabbit in the hair it's, or the rabbit in the tortoise. It's not the fastest person to the finish line. It's right. how you can finish the race. And, um, you know, as long as everyone works their own race, it's, it's their own victory, not, not mine, not yours. It's, it's theirs. Yeah. Great. What are some of the habits you have developed, um, that will help you be successful long-term that, that will help you, uh, continue this race? Um, well, I'm not a fan of running, but, uh, I do enjoy spinning. Uh, I started, I did spinning years ago. I took it as a, a class in college and I was in my thirties going back to school and took a PE elective. And I, I thought, oh, well, spinning and it's at the local rec center. Really liked it. At the time I was about 230, 240 pounds. Uh, and I lost weight. I got down to about 210. Uh, had joined another gym and was doing some of that hit type of uh, exercising, uh, and did that for Which, a little while. For, for those, sorry to interrupt, but for those who don't know, high intensity interval training is what that right. stands for. Right, and I got down to about 110, but that's where I kept kind of hitting a wall over the last 16 years. Or sorry, not 110, 210. 210. Could not yeah. hit under 200 just and I'd get frustrated and things like I said life things would happen I'd give up and I'd have to focus on other things and not myself uh which a lot of us do and um that sorry so I I've gotten back into the spinning I have I bought years ago a spin bike and like so many people when they buy some equipment becomes a clothing hanger <laughs> uh, it did that for 10 years <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it was when, after I had the exercise and I, or sorry, after I had the surgery and I, and I knew the exercise needed to come and it was like, okay, we're six, eight weeks after we need to start putting that in. I wanted to get on that bike and I was at about two thirty again. So slowly I started getting on. Now I won't. I want to. I want people to understand it wasn't perfect either. One of the things I had to learn, uh, as I was feeling so much better and losing the weight and uh, getting on before work and doing 30, 40, 45 minutes, um, is my body started kind of failing me, getting exhausted. I've had that cycle happen a couple times, and. Um, well, so many of us will be gung ho about it. You got to listen to your body. 
Um, I found myself uh, in late March, just after I started exercising, struggling with fatigue. Um, and then it gave my body a little time, didn't really exercise a ton, but kept my eating habits up and then went back to it, slowly building up. August, so just, you know, last month or yeah, last month, I had the same thing happen. I I had another crash with my body just uh, struggling with uh, keeping up with all of the changes. And I had to spend uh, most of the month just letting my body decompress a little bit. And mentally, it's a little hard. I want to get back on it. I want to do it. But I had to listen. And, and that's a really important part of this and uh, is listening to your body. Yeah, great points. Uh, before we started recording, you mentioned uh, your love of the three of the liquid diet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe share share with the listeners a little bit about that and, and how that impacted you. So uh, when you go through this journey, it's very clear that uh, the process uh, is a liquid diet. Uh, that's fat reducing, uh, liver um, reducing diet, shrinking diet. It's called so uh, several different things. And um, that way that Dr. Rasmussen, when he goes in to do the the procedure, has room to to move his tools, his the the laparoscopic yeah, robotic. Get, get the tools. liver out of the way. Yeah, and uh, it's super important that he has that ability to to move around because the surgery can be canceled. So I took that super seriously because this is something I wanted. So many of us want so bad is uh, is this help and so uh i got called december 28th of uh, 2023 and they said we, we'd like to schedule your surgery and i'm like great i've been waiting for this call you know it's through the holidays and it's like oh uh, and uh they're like okay well it's it's going to be pretty soon it's going to be pretty quick here and i'm like give it to me and they're like january 11th and i'm like okay cool you know, and I'm thinking, all right, last meals and different things, what I want to do to have one more time as I go to change my life, right? Unhealthy kind of behaviors, but <laughs> I think called, a lot of us the last have supper them. syndrome, <laughs> right? A lot of us have that. And yep. uh, so then she says, you need to start your liquid diet tomorrow. Oh, okay. So I was headed to work. I work nights. I was headed to work, stopped at Walmart on my way into work picked up all my my shakes to get going and I worked that weekend nights through the new year. So the potlucks and different things that we're we're doing um you know I'm drinking my protein drinks and you know I I tried to play with them a little bit and mix a strawberry one with a dark chocolate one and make it a you know dark chocolate strawberry <laughs> Uh, I enjoyed doing the broth because I needed something savory. You can, some people can do all the sweets. I needed the savory part to kind of balance all that out. And the broth, I would take a rotisserie chicken from Costco because uh, it had so many good flavors to it and do a bone, bone broth. And then I would drink that to offset all the sweet. Um, I did some sugar-free jello, really no popsicles. Uh, a lot of water. I got onto the uh, water talk trend for a while. Uh, got a bunch of the flavor packets and the skinny syrups. Uh, if people aren't familiar with that, you know, they can look at water talk out there on TikTok or uh, there's different uh, platforms. Uh, the different platforms usually have something Insta or Facebook. And you just mix the different drink packets with water. I got a circle, um, one of those circle water bottles with the flavor and stuff. So uh, and I had started doing that before the surgery. So I start really trying to drink a lot as well. It is hard. Uh, it is very hard. And it is, that's where you start realizing uh, really your unhealthy relationship with food, because some of the thoughts that enter your mind is, well, Dr. Rasmussen isn't going to know if I have a cheat. Dr. Rasmussen isn't going to know, like if I, especially if I do it early on, I can have a, a meal and no one will know, or, you know, I'm, I'm two days out, three days out from surgery. And if I just have a little bit of a, 
you know, a couple potato chips, he'll never know. Well, that maybe, but um, I found it more challenging. It to me, that was like, you challenged me, do that two week liquid diet. And uh, I took it very seriously. Uh, it was hard. I cried some. Uh, my husband wanted to go to Taco Bell one day. And I just cried, you know, because you just, you miss chewing food. That's a hard one too. For for those weeks, even post-op where you're just eating soft foods and stuff, that sensation of chewing. Again, that's where I started realizing like, yeah, there there are some unhealthy relationships I have here that I need to start changing. And that's what I use that post-op time for was really starting to look at that relationship and, uh, but it's worth it. This is all worth it. Two weeks of liquid diet, I promise is worth it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, we like to talk about non-scale victories. So, uh, things where your life has changed, uh, but it, it's not necessarily a number on a scale. Share with us some of the, the non-scale victories in your life. Oh, so a year ago, right about just like a week before um, I came to see you, I was sent on a work trip to South Carolina. I hadn't been on a plane for a while. A lot of people talk about this, the seatbelt. I was almost to an extender. Like literally the seatbelt was uh, ex out all that it could be. Now it wasn't tight. It wasn't loose. It was just right on that cusp. Again, another, uh, you know, something's got to give. Um, I went to Philadelphia two weeks ago. I, that thing was cinched up. I, I mean, I went from, um, I wore men's clothes a lot. I just felt more comfortable in them. Um, I liked to hide myself. I learned, uh, to hide myself in black clothing over the waist baggy. I'm sure. A lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, men and women are the same hiding in their clothes. And, um, I went from my uniform, which was a men's two XL, like shirt, uh, a men's, uh, 44 size pant. And this is, I don't admit this to people. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's, I was big. I'm, uh, but certainly I know there are people that str have struggled more, um, to where I, when I've gone down the sizes, there was a small period of time that I wore my husband's pants because he was, a, he's a 38 and, uh, uh, uniforms are expensive. So as I went down yeah. in sizes, I used that for a minute. And then, um, finally I'm down to a size six in women's, uh, pretty consistently. Sometimes it's an eight, um, between a 26 and a 28, uh, in whether it's men's or women's clothes, uh, size small. If, if I do get a men's shirt anymore, smaller, medium in a women's shirt, coats, different things like that, hoodies. Um, yeah, I just, I hid this necklace I have on was given to me from my mom. My neck was a 17 and a half. I couldn't wear it. Um, but as I've lost the weight, my neck size is now a 12. Um, and I take my measurements. Uh, the, that is important to me, especially with the sleep apnea, right? Um, and I'm getting a sleep study done here soon, so that hopefully I can ditch the ditch the CPAP permanently. Yeah, that's um, great. I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that I. I mean, there's just so many positives from it. The comorbidities, like I said, the the inc uh, the incontinence gone. Like I can sleep. Six to eight hours, even longer at times if I'm, you know, without having to get up to use the restroom, where before it was two, three times a night. Um, I don't have reflux at all. Don't medicate for it. Uh, I, the cholesterol is, is still on the high side. I'm hoping as time goes and stuff that may change. Maybe that's genetically just not my, in the, in the cards for me, but uh, I have reduced my asthma medication. Uh, so I only take a pill instead of inhalers now. Um, and there was, uh, the sleep apnea, the incontinence is gone. Just weird. And then, um, 
I'm, I think that's about that. All oh, with that, the my pants. That's another thing. So when I put on my pants, I was trying to explain this to someone else the other day because my pants were out like here, and you put them on and you see your leg going, you see your leg going, and it looks like it fits and it's fine. Now my pants are a lot smaller, and I look and I'm like, my leg isn't going to fit even into the the waist, and that's that's a hard one for me every day still. There are still some things that are are challenging that it's like I go to put on my uniform, you know, and I'm like, that's. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're looking at that and in your mind, you're still the past size. And Mm -hmm. so you look at that and there's, there's no way I'm going to fit into that. Right. Yeah. And I think there's um, a reality for a lot of people that way where they, they, that psychologically, that's. Still a rough thing. Like I shopped at Lane Bryant for years. That's what fit. I never thought to go anywhere else because I, and that's why I wore men's clothes mostly, unless I needed to get something a little more feminine, basketball shorts, sweats, hoodies, hide it, cover it. And uh, now it, it was, it's really still hard for me to make that mental adjustment that, yeah, this is okay. It's my size and they fit appropriately. They're not skin tight. They're not, they are appropriately fitting. Wow. That's great. And you know, that is an important point that people deal with a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, typically termed body dysmorphia. So Mm -hmm. what you see is different than the reality. Um, you know, your shape is different and, uh, it, it takes some time. It takes some time and, and processing and, and working through that. Yeah. Yep. Day by day. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what else do we need to know about you and your story? Uh, it's been, it's been a wonderful journey. I would a hundred percent do this again. I mean, I wish I had done it sooner. It wasn't my time. Um, but you know, it, it's, a work in progress. I w- I'm hoping that maybe in a couple of years, since I am only, you know, nine almost nine months out, that you and I can chat again and see where where things are at. Since I'm I'm not one that's you know, two years out, thirteen years out. I'm I'm new, and there is that possible possibility of weight gain uh, that comes back as as uh, we talk about as we're going into all the surgery that um, you can gain up to 50% of the weight you lose back. Right. So Uh, yeah, depending on which study you look at, um, typically you had a gastric bypass. Um, for most people with a gastric bypass, they're going to keep the majority of the weight off. Um, but you know, there are subsets and, and really what I find is it's usually when they stop using the tool, you know, you pointed out before it's a tool and, and you've got to use it appropriately. And, um, you know, when, when people quit using the tool, that's when they tend to run into trouble. Um, but, uh, you know, developing these habits early on, staying engaged with, uh, with your physician. I mean, there's, you know, other tools we can use if people are struggling with different things. So, um, you know, lot, lots of resources, um, available to help people be successful. And you mentioned you'd listened to a few of the, the other podcasts. I've got, you know, several patients who've, you're several years into it and, and doing very well. And, and yeah, we'd love to have you back uh, in a few years and, and, uh, you know, tell us that part of the story. Yeah. Hopefully, it, you know, at that point I can be retired and on to other things, but you know, this has been a great adventure and I love every single day getting up and looking forward to what I can do now. I have a new lease on life. Um, heading into from 50 on, you know, I, I still may have some medical things pop up. You never know. But I have the opportunity to, I guess, start over or keep or move forward, but in a different direction uh, and enjoy the things. I just found out I'm going to be a grandma next year. And congratulations. Uh, thank you. And so I'm super excited about that. And I'll be able to see my my grandchildren grow and I'll be healthy enough to run around with them and and do things that before I was just too tired and I lacked the energy and and the mobility and the stamina. Uh, but again, it's a work in progress. I have to continue doing my part and continue 
doing those things to make those things continue to happen. It's not just going to go, okay, I'm done. I The tools worked. I've lost the weight. I can stop exercising. I can stop worrying about my portions or my protein or my water. Um, those are the cool things that have really changed in my mind and uh, made things so much, so much better. So that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yes, it, it's it is it is a chronic disease, and with chronic disease, it's you know the, your for your life you're going to be dealing with you know those different things. But you, you know, just as you've stated, you've made those changes. Those it's easier now. Um, and, uh, and that will continue for you. I'm, I'm fairly confident. I am too. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to hear your story. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing it. Thank you too, Dr. Asmus. And I'm thrilled with how things are going and, you know, I couldn't be more grateful. Thanks again to Carrie Sipple for sharing her story. I love all of the changes she shared with us and what a difference it's made in her life. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. It will help us reach more people with these amazing stories. I also have a YouTube channel where you can see this video as well as several other videos about surgical weight loss, general surgery, and robotic surgery. Join us next time for another amazing story.